Well, when Steve said we were falling behind in winning in trade uh, and losing in trade, I had the feeling that we're falling behind on this agenda, but we're winning in terms of the richness of what's being described. Uh, I'm a bit the loser in this in terms of limited time, but I want to hit on a very big topic that I think stands alongside the kind of classical analyses of international relations that are naturally triggered uh, by our topic about the liberal world order and what may upset it. And alongside this also is the economic analysis that you've just been treated to. But it seems to me the most fundamental thing in many respects underlying all of this is the technology tsunami that we're all experiencing. You see this reflected when Mike immediately talks about China and the uh, internet and internet governance. We're all richly aware of the IT revolution. Um, I just want to underscore to you that we shouldn't treat IT, which is the technology of the moment, as the end of technological history. We are seeing dramatic innovations in biology, robotics, new materials, space, additive manufacturing, data analysis, et cetera, artificial intelligence. I could go on with the list, but I'd require more than the eight minutes Nick has given me. I'd suggest, though, that um, these are fundamentally affecting our notions of the liberal world order. Um, it shouldn't surprise us that they do. If you look back at the great changes in history, you see technology, the printing press and Galileo and the telescope, overturning the status quo and the world order as the church has it. You see in the 19th century uh, the effects of the Industrial Revolution on our notions of state power and state control. More recently, I believe that the invention of birth control is one of the most fundamental changes technologically and undergirds much of the dramatic revolution that we call feminism that's occurring in our time. So, we should recognize that technological change, this tsunami, is not uh, something that simply exists in its own realm. It fundamentally affects all realms. I think to switch metaphors from tsunami uh, to something else, it's, it's an underlying change in the tectonic plates that produce all, produces all kinds of what appear to be disparate uh, earthquakes uh, whether if you look at this morning's newspaper, it's the proliferation of biology and to North Korea, or the Carpenter case in the Supreme Court about the ability of the state to seize cell phones and the like. So in uh, the paper in the book, uh, I sketch three things I'm not going to talk about now. I'm just going to briefly mention the fourth. Um, one is that the way in which this proliferation empowers groups and non-state entities uh, this is a familiar song, but I think there's some interesting new things that can be said about it. As technology competes with the state, in effect, by setting up these non-state enterprises and empowering them, not just in weapons, but also in the equivalent of what any state would have regarded as an astonishing intelligence agency by virtue of what they can harvest from commercial data and the like. A second thing is the way this proliferation balances out U.S. power as technology that we used to be preeminent and dominant in spreads to other countries and enables them to, to compete with us. And this changes the, the world order in, I think, important ways. And a third, which I think is much less recognized, is the risk of accidents and emergent effects as these very complex, opaque, novel systems are developed and interact with one another, particularly in the military context, in ways that we can't fully anticipate. And I think there are grave risks of unintended effects for us in that arena that I think are also worthy of discussion. The point I want to focus on, though, in conclusion is, is a yet more radical one, which is the way in which these technologies challenge our very notions of the liberal order. We see how authoritarian states can use technologies to restrict privacy, to monitor individuals and the like. Uh, very striking um, how we all leave trails of DNA, DNA dust. You will have left your DNA in this room when you depart. Um, we also leave trails of digital dust. Everyone will know from monitoring your cell phone, et cetera, that you were here. I doubt you're in the singular minority that didn't bring a cell phone to this event. Uh, these things are empower not only authoritarian states, but also our own state in ways that erode our privacy and the like. They also are going to pose very fundamental challenges to us 
as different states develop different norms for dealing with these technologies. I can anticipate in the United States very dramatic issues associated with, for example, how we manipulate our bodies, embryos and the like. Uh, we are used to the abortion debate and how deeply it has affected us here. What happens when people begin to try and choose amongst embryos, for example, to maximize their intelligence of their offspringing? of their offspring, not simply to avoid diseases and the like. What happens when China begins to make a different choice in that regard? Suppose they decide that uh, intelligence is something to be optimized in the embryos of their population, and Americans make different decisions. 200 babies are born every day in America today uh, that were conceived in test tubes. Where are we going from here? Uh, and I have a set of issues associated with that. But most fundamentally, and finally, I would just put to you the idea that the very liberal notions of what it means to be an individual and of individual choice, of how in a democracy we put together majorities and make choices, are challenged by technologies. We tend to ascribe this to things like, oh, the Russian interference with Facebook and the like, and we marvel at the technological attributes of that. Facebook takes three million ads every day. Let's not be too simplistic about how they might screen these things. But think also about the way data analysis combines with the earlier observations about digital tracking that I made in terms of political persuasion. Demo it's been demonstrated that uh, with 10 Facebook likes, information about that, people can, a uh, machine, using artificial intelligence, can predict your preferences more accurately than your colleagues in the workplace. With 70 Facebook likes, they can predict this information more accurately than your friends can about what you will choose to do. With uh, 150 Facebook likes, they can predict more accurately than your family members can, with 300 more accurately than your spouse. Well, I'm not amazed that others can predict my preferences more accurately than my spouse, but think about what this means in terms of political action. Because when you link this analytic capability with our ability to uh, reach individual targets en masse, now as a politician, I can select your particular preference in some sub area and target you individually in that sub area. Now that may seem to you to be okay, but what I can do is create highly differentiated messages. I no longer have to put together majorities. I can begin to put together in effect, a dominant group of people spliced together from a whole lot of individual things instead of speaking broadside to the group. This changes, I think, the fundamental premises of democracy associated with what political speech is, with what electoral processes look like, and ultimately also with what it means to be an individual and the way in which we are subject all, I think, to manipulation when we're well understood. Much more could be said about this, but the one thing I will understand is that my time is up. Uh, so I'm going to stop and yield the floor. Thank you.